Francis Levy, co-director of the Philip Teddy Center, and welcome to Weather and Imagination. Now, the art you see on the walls here is from an exhibition curated by Hallie Cohn, the um, chairman, the chair of the art department at Marymount Manhattan College. It's called Pathetic Fallacy, Weather and Imagination. I'm now honored to introduce Deborah Cohn. Deborah Cohn is an assistant professor of history at Barnard College, Columbia University, where she teaches modern Central European history and history of science and technology. Shoot, lucky I was waiting, you know, because weather, where did that fit into modern European history? I mean, I guess, I guess it plays a rather important role when you look about, you look about the, what happened to the French when they retreated from... <laughs> Invasion of Russia. <laughs> uh, her research is driven by an interest in how scientists grapple with uncertainty and unpredictability. Currently, she is studying how Central European climate scientists in the first half of the 20th century struggled to demarcate local climates in the face of the radical shifts in scale of their patron states. Her previous research probed the intersection of science and family dynamics in fin de siècle Vienna. She is the author of Vienna in the Age of Uncertainty, Science, Liberalism, and Private Life, and a co-editor of Intimate Universality, Local and Global Themes in the History of Weather and Climate. Dr. Cohn will moderate this afternoon's discussion and introduce the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm I, I want to thank Francis and um, the rest of the Phylac TD Center for um, organizing this panel. And um, I want to thank the panelists for fitting it into their busy lives and, um, um, and everyone here for coming today. I'm really excited that we've been able to assemble a group of scholars whose work is so profound, um, both academically and um, at human level and which covers such a broad geographic range. Um, so I'm going to introduce the other panelists. Um, this is Stephanie Le Manager. Um, she is Associate Professor in the English Department at the University of Cal California, Santa Barbara, and Director of the University's American Cultures and Global Context Center. Her first book was titled Manifest and Other Destinies, Territorial Fictions of the 19th Century United States. Um, it explored literary depictions of the uninhabitable, uninhabitable spaces that resisted Western expansion, deserts, oceans, and rivers. And it won the 2005 Thomas J. Lyon Award for the best book in Western American Literary Studies. Her book in progress is titled Weather Events, Climate and Culture in North America, and she just described it to us as a study of weather and the literary imagination. And Stephanie recently held a Mellon Fellowship for research at the Huntington Library. She's also won a number of awards for her teaching. Um, this is Sheila Jasanoff, who is the Fortzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She's also taught at many top institutions in the United States Britain, and Japan. She holds degrees in mathematics, linguistics, and law. And her research has explored from many angles how science and technology become subject to legislation and public debate in democratic societies. She's the author or editor of about 10 books, so I won't name them all. But most recently, she's published a comparative study of the politics of biotechnology in Europe and the US, which is titled Designs on Nature. Uh, Sheila has won numerous awards, including being named a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, next is Ben Orlov, who is Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis. He is also an adjunct senior research scientist at Columbia's International Research Institute for Climate and Society. He is an anthropologist by training who has worked in Central and South America, Australia, and now Africa. So really covered the globe, um, even, I think, Scandinavia. Well, I, I did hike for a week in Norway. So okay. I'm talking about research if you want. But... Um, and he's now focusing on uh, human responses to climate variability. His research has won major grants from the National Science Foundation and elsewhere. Um, he is a co-editor of the book Weather, Culture, and Climate, a book that I've learned a lot from. And his writing reaches well beyond disciplinary borders with uh, a book for general readers on Lake Titicaca and a memoir of his father. 
And finally, this is um, Anthony Lazarowitz, who's Director of Strategic Initiatives and a uh, research scientist at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. He is also the director of the Yale Project on Climate Change. He holds a PhD in environmental science, and his research is focused on public perceptions of environmental risk, drawing comparisons at local, regional, and national levels from Alaska to Argentina. Um, he has published dozens of articles and won numerous prestigious grants for his research. And he's a contributing editor of the journal Environment. He's also a very talented photographer of the natural world, and I encourage you to take a look at his website for um, examples of his photography. So I'm going to um, begin. Um, the five of us spend a lot of time thinking about weather, but I imagine not everyone here does. So I'm going to begin just by um, throwing out a very basic definition of weather, um, saying a few words about it, and then asking the other panelists if they have um, alternative definitions. Um, common definition of weather today is the condition of the atmosphere at a particular place and time. Mm -hmm. And we can distinguish weather from climate, or climate is defined as the average weather of a certain place. So I just want to note three things about these definitions. First, climate is a mathematical abstraction, right? It's an average. Weather is what we experience immediately, day to day. Um, and moreover, until quite recently, climate was defined as a stable average. In other words, climate change was an oxymoron. Um, it was only in the late 19th century that geological evidence of past ice ages, um, glaciers in northern Europe and the US um, convinced scientists that the Earth's <coughs> climates could, in fact, vary drastically. Okay, so secondly, um, note that the definition of weather is restricted to the atmosphere at a single place in time. And we might want to talk about um, just how big a place, just how long a time that might mean. Um, but for this reason, um, there can't be any such thing as global weather, mm. even continental weather. It's even been suggested that the US has been slower to respond to climate change than small European nations because there's no national experience of weather in the US. Right? We're such a climatically diverse country. Okay. Thirdly, this definition of weather, the most widely used today, makes no reference to people. That's a relatively recent departure. Earlier definitions of weather and climate were explicitly anthropocentric. Until the mid-18th century, extreme weather events were regularly interpreted as divine judgments, as portents. So the great London storm of 1703 was declared by the queen, quote, a token of divine displeasure. And as recently as the early 20th century, climate was defined more narrowly as those atmospheric conditions that affect human life. Uh, for instance, the great um, physical geographer um, Alexander von Humboldt wrote that climate is all the variations in the atmosphere that sensibly affect our organs. So today's non-anthropocentric definitions reflect the modern reinterpretation of weather and climate in the 19th century. What had previously been studied as clues to the character of a place and its human inhabitants, um, now, you know, so a geographic project now became a subfield of physical science, which could, could just as well be carried out through laboratory experiments or later computer models as through observations um, in the world, in the field. So in other words, the modern science of weather abandoned a human framework. Um, do you, do, does anyone want to offer some alternative definitions of weather that you've found useful, relevant to your work? Well, we're in an English-speaking context here, so we are used to the word weather. And I now regret not having looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary that would give the earliest use. But it's cognate with the German word Wetter, so it sounds like it's an old Germanic thing that we've had for a while. And the Romance languages, our high school French is le temps, and it's tiempo in Spanish, which is the same as the word for time, which I think is linked to the changeability. And so when you use the word, people can tell by context whether you mean weather or time. And um, the, I think there are languages that actually don't have an abstract word for weather. 
that they could, or, or, I, the one, better not do that again. <laughs> the, uh, I'll make other gestures to attempt to convey my sincerity. Um, the, 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 the one, uh, the, the one um, indigenous language I know a bit, uh, people might say, is it, is, it, is it raining or is it not raining? And so, and, and that, that is another use of the word weather in English, you could say, come in out of the weather would mean it's raining outside. And if it was a sunny day, you'd just say, come inside. And so, th and that thing of whether weather is the events or whether, whether there's always weather or <laughs> is it just kind of when something dramatic happens is another way that the word plays out. Which I suppose, uh, I'm, uh, I as an anthropologist think that that's all cultural framing, but I'm sure many different types of psychologists would talk about w how attention is given what you notice, what you don't notice. One thing that comes to my mind, having done some research in the history of weather observation and the imagining of weather in the United States, is how weather um, became a problem for nation formation and nation building in the late 18th and early 19th century. And Thomas Jefferson was the person who, of course, wanted to create a national weather service of some kind or another or National Weather Survey and in part his goal was to try to I think somehow get the ephemeral quality of weather under control and to create something like the homogenous empty time that Benedict Anderson says structures the nation uh, via a kind of um, disciplining of the weather, or at least a demarcation of the weather as a, a, a national event rather than a series of local <clears throat> events. So I think that there's been uh, attempts to assail this definition or the set of definitions that you offer, and yet um, I think those definitions have held and have, in fact, the weather has repeatedly in the United States, and at least in the work I've done, threatened. Um, various versions of national community and uh, national symbology. So that's more of a gloss than an uh, alteration of the definitions you provide. It's pointing to there are different people who can speak with authority about the weather. Mm -hmm. And so that, that Jefferson was quite early and that was an early effort in a new nation to say that there's a national way of speaking about the weather. And, but I think there is also just a common sense way of talking about the weather. I, uh, God knows what psychologists think about that notion of common sense, but it's just the, kind of the everyday, the vernacular, we all experience it, we all go out, we see it. The, um, the efforts, on the one hand, you do want to control, do you want to know whether you, you really want weather forecasts. I'm certainly aware that there's some snow due to be coming in and kind of thinking about that, glad I packed the right clothes. <laughs> but I also just kind of, you know, I, I'm not quite sure it's going to uh, come to pass. I think it, the first point that Ben made about Anglophone countries and weather being an English word, even if it's Germanically um, descended, uh, that's really very important, I think, because uh, you know there's the fine British joke that we don't have climate in Britain, we only have weather. Um, <laughs> and that, that reflects the, the sort of intense variability of uh, what it's like just to go outdoors and you know you carry an umbrella and it may be raining one minute and may not be the next minute and so on and so forth. In India there's not that kind of talk about weather at all. When you get a seasonal change it's fixed in place for a long time. So you have the dry season and everybody knows it's the dry. There's no point saying what's the weather going to be like in the month of May. Every day is going to be like every other day in Delhi and it's going to be very hot and dry and no, it's not going to rain. So the whole way of thinking and talking about weather there gets tied to something that in current parlance we refer to as weather events and mm -hmm. we call them extreme weather events. So there's lots of language for the type of storm or the type of wind, but not about weather. It, it's in how uh, everyday conversation about weather that seems in a way, so banal is also a rich topic, and um, people in California do comment about mm. about the lack of weather, and I, 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 uh, just another damn day in paradise. Well, especially <laughs> alienated <laughs> Easterners who go to California <laughs> and say, you know, we miss the changing of the seasons. So, but, but, there could, but there could be, um, even in places that have predictable mm. seasons, there might be, people might, or might, I don't know, some places people might come, it's a little hotter, it's a little cooler, there's a breeze, there's... But from my own sort of childhood experiences, 
of the weather in India, it's what you notice are the sharp breaks. I mean, yes. so when the stormy season comes, the clouds building up yes. and the storm finally breaking. And it may amuse you that one of my early sort of weather-related childhood memories is that we didn't have refrigeration when I was very young. Um, and a favorite dessert that was made in our house was jello, known as jelly pudding. Um, but it got made when there were hailstorms. So, because people would collect the hail and that would produce the ice. But that's, it's not about weather, you know, uh -huh. it's a whole sort of cultural combination of a break in a regular pattern and something very strange happening and then, you know, that then becoming a celebratory occasion and rituals being constructed around it. You know, I, I can't really, I, I'm surprised that I've never stopped to reflect on eating snow, which is something that <laughs> Americans do and well, my, my... With maple syrup. Well, with, I guess some of them do, you know, my, and I never quite know, as a parent, I, I ate snow as a kid and just, uh, it would be fresh snow, I, I assure you, but it's, when I go to the mountains with my kids, I'm always fearful that it's not quite clean enough and it's, but it's... Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, I was just going to say that, I mean, one thing, uh, we always as economics tend to come back to the denotative meaning of things. So we tend to look at dictionaries and we look for these kind of established standard definitions. But in some ways I think what's far more interesting and important in a lot of ways is the connotative meaning of these, of these terms. Uh, you know, what are the kind of emotions, what are the kind of feelings that are brought up by these terms, uh, what are the kind of images that come to mind, the metaphors that we use these, these to, to reflect and, and to in fact construct our surrounding worlds. And in particular, you know, weather happens to be one of those things that I like to think of as like a social glue. I mean, it's one of the things that unites all of us. I mean, how many cabs have you been into and the one thing you talk about is the weather? Um, well, I'll leave that aside for a moment. I think, I think cabbies are one of the best unused resources to communicate about climate change in this country. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, it, it's one of these things that does unite all of us. I mean, it's the one thing that you can actually go to people in this city. I mean, the diversity of people in the city, and yet we all experience something of the same kind of weather conditions. And it, it does make it easy to, to do that. But that's in a even in the most urban setting, but I, I do a lot of work uh, among the Inupiaq Eskimo in northwest Alaska, and there it's central to cultural identity. I mean, it's the fact that we are a people who have experienced some of the most extreme and hostile weather conditions on the planet that is fundamental to who we are. In fact, um, uh, one of the great uh, Inuit leaders right now uh, the Inuit are actually suing uh, the United States uh, under the Organization of American States, saying that their rights are being violated uh, and that they have a right to be cold. <laughs> okay? We don't want to be warm. Our whole culture, our whole ways of life, our whole mythology, our cosmology, who we are as a people are fundamentally based on the fact that it's cold here. Um, and as that's changing, obviously, many aspects of society, from the practical to the cosmological, are, are, um, are, are being transformed right underneath them. So again, I think the, the de dictionary definitions are always nice, but fundamentally it's about how do we use the meanings, the connotative meanings of these, of these terms and these experiences of weather in our everyday lives that ultimately I find most interesting. I think it's interesting to kind of move off of that that idea of weather talk as, as speaking to something that we can all relate to as humans and creating a kind of universality to the, to the other reaction that weather talk often produces, at least in my experience, which is, why are you talking to me about the weather? This is actually a quote from one of my colleagues. But, <laughs> but the point is sort of, you know, why are you talking to me about something that we know, this is sort of phatic communication, we know this is, this, there's no real content here, that you're using weather as a way of attempting to create a kind of false commonality between us, common experience, but, but actually uh, weather itself somehow has no import. Um, so we think of it as a fallback, a little bit like talking about baseball scores or something with the cabbie. You know, it's, 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 we're not going to talk about politics because that might be a little too engaging. Mm -hmm. So weather has this sort of quality of safety and superficiality. And yet on the other hand, as you suggest with the, with the group that you're working with in Alaska, um, it also can, impinges on us in the most intimate and profound ways and shapes our cultures, our beliefs, our religions, etc. So there's a strange for me, kind of um, opposition between that 
those two modes of conceiving weather as a vehicle for communicating culture, I guess. I, I'd be interested in hearing um, in each of your research, sort of if you reflect on it for a minute, do you think that um, you treat weather more as an individual or a collective experience? I mean, it seems like there are strong arguments for viewing it either way, um, whether as the, right, the romantics experience of nature, the development of um, a modern self in relation to the natural other, whether, as, as you've been saying, um, as a, a way of bridge, um, finding together a community, a collective experience. So how, how are you using it in your research? And maybe say a little bit about your methods also. Um, I think that for me, um, and I'm a scholar of literature, so I actually have a great deal to learn from all of these folks who are doing more interdisciplinary studies of weather than I am. But for me, climate has a kind of political valence um, that relates to ideas uh, of culture, sometimes of ethnicity, sometimes of nationhood. It can be mobilized in certain kinds of political debates um, in a way that weather uh, cannot. Um, so I see climate as the way of speaking for a collective uh, and speaking on the part of collective action or in an attempt to make some sort of intervention. Um, the work that I do is historical and I'm interested in how certain climates figure in the U.S. literary and cultural imagination as deconstructive of nat national ideals. So for example, when Civil War uh, soldiers, Union soldiers went down into parts of the Deep South, particularly the, the wet um, malarial South, um, and found themselves stuck up in, in the mud to their knees and mud caking on their feet like suet, uh, one, one man said, a kind of suet sauce for a pudding, um, they, they started to um, sort of real, de, de, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, alienate themselves from the idea of unionism, which had been a very potent ideology and the reason for going to war and the, to begin with. But once they got down there, it was very hard for them to recognize these regional climates as something that they could experience a sort of topophilic identification for, to use a term from the humanist geographer Yifu Tuan, who talks about topophilia as human love of place. So that climate um, I think has never been entirely seen as a national climate, part of America. And one of the reasons why people kept saying, talking heads on television about Katrina, this is not America, was that they were looking at, in fact, predictable phenomenon on the Gulf Coast, this tremendous hurricane, this storm, but one that people uh, in much of the country don't like to think of as predictable or natural or part of their idea of, again, the nation and its symbology. So um, that's just one example I could think of others, but there, it seems to me that climate does speak for collective experience and has been mobilized in various political ways, sometimes in the service of problematic ideologies, whereas weather does seem to be a more romantic and post-romantic um, mode of experience that people, in my research anyway, guard um, as, they, as they guard what they see as the, the value of their own senses to tell them the story of the world, really. So, excuse me for a bit long-winded uh, response. But. Well, from my point of view, what I'm really interested in is the ways in which what we know links up with how we choose to do the things that we do collectively. And so I wouldn't draw a distinction between individual and collective. What interests me is partly how knowledge becomes common property at all, so that we think we know the same things. Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, why is it the case that there hasn't been just about any controversy about whether climate change is linked to human-made causes when you go over to Western Europe, but in this country there has been a lot of contestation. Why is there a differentiation of opinion in America and not in Europe? All of the standard kinds of things that you could allege about more different countries, like you know, possible educational differences, technological differences, those don't obtain between Europe and, and the US. Um, so from that point of view, you were asking about methodology. I'm particularly interested in the ways in which um, phenomena get made um, visible, measurable, tractable. So whether, as I think, Stephanie, you were already saying, was uh, you know, from Jefferson 
onwards has been a piece of nation building. Uh, the same is not necessarily true of the term of the concept climate. And in fact, I think that the switch in um, policy talk from weather to climate uh, to some extent displaces the locus or adds a new locus of, of power making, bumping it up to global. We actually had to create a new institution called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to produce the data that establishes for the world as a whole now that there is a phenomenon that we want to think of as climate change. And, you know, although climate was understood nationally and regionally as well, weather has never been understood globally. That goes back, Debbie, to your initial definition. So what, how does it happen in the first place that we create a way of looking at nature that is actually not located in the nation state anymore, and who controls the tools and devices. And then, as a science studies scholar, scholar, I'm deeply interested in the fact that you get a sort of narrowing of the funnel. So to know climate change as a global phenomenon, you've got to control computers and computer modeling. And you know, only about six places in the world have those resources and everybody else is sort of derivatively dependent. Um, so that can open up all <coughs> kinds of interesting micro questions about how the credibility of knowledge making is sustained at a global level. It also opens up all kinds of further interesting questions about who actually knows, you know, whether it's weather or climate or whatever, because the vast majority of the world hasn't a clue what these climate models are about and what they're doing and why should we believe them at all or not. They do. Everybody in the world has a clue, like your cabbies, when they go outside, whether it's raining or not, whether they feel they need to put on a shawl or not. I mean, you know, so in that sense, perceptual weather is a common property. Climate is not. So how, how do those two things operate in tension against one another and for whom in what ways? That's the sort of thing that interests me. Our, our, as an anthropologist, I'd also see a, very, a, a relationship between the individual and the collective, much as people speak only with uh, languages that are shared, so too many other forms of activity are based on shared forms and yet are individual. And I was interested in those, those two words. You use the word uh, knowledge quite a bit and also use the word perception. And I think the word perception is, is an interesting word. And um, I, was struck with uh, von Humboldt's definition about the the organs, the the, the sensible organs, and <laughs> so this might be a point to interject the, the thought that much as we often speak of um, visible light, light in the visible spectrum, as if that it's in fact our eyes are the product of many millions of years of evolution to this uh, star that we have nearby that keeps us alive. So too, our skin is very sensitive to temperature and the temperature range that we can experience is something that, that has to do with the area we live in and what we've become accustomed to. But if there are the words uh, knowledge and perception, there's also the word experience, I think, which is an interesting one that um, links those and, I, and uh, experience can both be well, the two German words are the, the Erlebnis, the immediate experience, the thing that you have just for the moment, and then the Erfahrung, the experience of being experienced, of having lived through something for quite a while. There's something very immediate, very personal about um, about weather, about weather experience, and it's, it is, I think, those are the two points that Stephanie you were making, both that it can be very banal and very charged, and um, it's interesting that that in a way ties to another question we might get to that um, knowledge, perception, and experience in a way are all linked to authority. Who has who, who can make claims? Mm -hmm. You can make claims based on all of those, and they're made in different kinds of ways. And that's one of the fascinating things about weather is that on the one hand it is so technical and mysterious, and the, the science is remote, and yet it, it, that immediate experience is something that everyone has, and there might be other kinds, other areas where science intervenes in public life where people would not feel, I think, that their own personal experience would bear, and weather may be one of the clearest cases where everyone experiences this phenomenon. Okay, and so I actually come at this from a, a different perspective of, in some ways I look at both of the, this issue at the individual level, but particularly the individual level to try to understand the collective. Uh, and by that, what I mean is that I study how whole societies, let's take American society as one that I've focused a lot on, uh, 
uh, perceive uh, global warming. Okay? How do they perceive it? What kinds of policies do they support or oppose? What kinds of behaviors are they willing to change or not? And then from my perspective, why? Uh, what are the underlying psychological, cultural, political, even geographic reasons why some people seem to care and other people don't? And one of the techniques I use, to get back to the question about the methods we use, uh, I use actually a, a, uh, a form of free association. And we can all play along with this. Um, <laughs> I'm sure many of you use this technique in a far more sophisticated way than I do. But I'm a survey researcher, so I, I conduct nationally representative surveys, which allows me to say with X percent confidence that this is what the American people think. So here's the question. Uh, what's the first thought or image that comes to mind when you hear the words global warming? Okay. Now, how many people have an image of melting ice, snow, glaciers? Yes, absolutely. There it is. You guys represent the United States. That's, <laughs> that's, that's by far the single strongest set of associations to this issue. Okay? And many people think, we then ask them, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And they say it's a very bad thing. The problem is that how many of us live near melting glaciers or the Arctic or the Antarctic? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's hard to say, okay, it's, a t it's bad, but how does that affect me? <coughs> and yes, there are those of us who care deeply about how it affects, say, polar bears. On the other hand, there are plenty of other people who don't really care about what happens to polar bears. And that's the other point, is that there are different people within our society. There, there is no American public. There are American public. And we're each predisposed to care or not care based on ideology, <coughs> values, worldviews, etc. Um, of course, what complicates that picture is that there's no intrinsic connection between whether you live near the, the uh, ice caps or the glaciers and whether you care about them because, of course, America, more than any other Western industrial nation, has this long, long <coughs> history of caring about the wilderness precisely because nobody lives near it and it's <laughs> the sublime and it's mm -hmm. the thing that's out there and it's America's cathedrals and it's the source of American exceptionalism and so on and so forth. In Germany, when global warming first became a national issue, uh, Spiegel magazine had a very famous cover which showed Cologne Cathedral with just the spires visible and water covering the whole cathedral. And to me, that's always been an incredibly evocative image, partly because it's so different uh, from most things we have until the day after tomorrow, which was made by a German director, and the Statue of Liberty has all the ice in us, so, so that's a, a kind of um, iconic image that has certain parallels to the Cologne Cathedral. But if you ever traveled in Germany in the post-war years, even 20 years after the war, one of the kinds of photographs that you saw a lot was every time you walked into a church in Germany, you would see that church's history in 42 through 45, whenever the spires bombed out and so on. So this Cologne Cathedral with the spires showing intact, but the bottom, you know, with, with the flood, you know, erased, seemed to me an inversion and yet a continuation of the same sense of the destruction of civilization that Germans have lived with for decades. And so global warming in Germany fell into this preparedness to believe that everything could be lost, any built structure, any achievement could be washed away. And, you know, and, you know, I think that's closely linked to the fact that there is, has been no scientific controversy about climate change in Germany to speak of, even though, of course, German scientists sit on these committees and on these boards and so on. I mean, so they should be quarreling about the basis of the knowledge. We do, even if we believe in it, we do. But, you know, it's quite interesting to think about why not. And I think that's a great point, is that there are different cultural narratives that an issue like climate change can either activate or not. I mean, these are whole networks of association, uh, in my terms, mm. in the human mind that predispose one to either accept this as a new idea or as, a, as something that it helps explain the things that we're experiencing. Do you think in our these are biological networks of association or profoundly acculturated networks oh, of association? Well, both. Both. I mean, we are biological beings, we are cultural beings. It's not one or the other, it's both. Um, I've done a few interviews in Peru in the high in the Andes near, for people who do live near melting glaciers. 
And one of the things that I thought I was going to be interested in seeing, it was also very kind of open-ended, oh, here are the glaciers, tell me about them. I was interested to see who described the time frame of change in terms of years and who who described it in terms of generations. And I was curious to see wh whether they did both. And that was a very easy thing to, I could both listen to the narratives and also make little tick marks and do some analysis. And I discovered that there's a third time frame that some people use there, which is of epochs. And it was really very mm -hmm. troubling to hear people say, when all the ice is gone, a big wind will come and blow everything away, and there'll be no more life. And I, I, it was, I, I felt bad interviewing. I, I, I thought, you know, yeah. anthropologists interview on all kinds of terrible things, you know, AIDS and uh, police abuse and torture. And I thought the weather, at least, that was safe. But are they really, are there, it, there's a long history in the Andes of these cataclysmic changes. And th there's, from, what, from what's recorded of the pre uh, Europe pre-Columbian religion from the documents from the 16th century, there were such epics and the kind of colonial Christianity really melded together stories of floods and so forth. And so it's this capacity for the belief in, this belief in catastrophe is something that people can hold in various ways and ways that, and the old stories can come, come forward, collective stories. And there's a way in which, in a way, there is a way in which it is a truth that I don't think th these people won't sit there and shiver and starve when the, as, the, as the streams dry up and their herds die off, they'll move, some of them, and probably some of the children, there'll be more infant mortality, I think, if the, food, if the diet isn't as adequate. But there is a sense in which they're telling the truth. The world will be unrecognizably different. And just a, a more American uh, version of how these issues get filtered through or, or resonate with uh, deeper cultural stories. Uh, one thing I found in my own work is that there are a small, fortunately, very small proportion of Americans who seem to interpret the whole issue of global warming and climate change within the storyline of revelations. So global warming, I don't care about that. That's actually a good thing. It's a sign that the return of Christ is nigh. Okay? So, I mean, that's probably not a story that I think most Americans immediately go to, but it is a very powerful cultural story among certain groups, and that does shape the way they interpret this issue. But I can interject one second. It does, yes. it does, in biblical kind of imagery, it never seems to rain, in, of course, in Eden. Never there's rains no, in Eden. No, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and yeah, you, you, after, you, know, you took the flood, you know, the flood, yeah. you know, and, then, and, then, and, and all the weather changes occur after the, after the fall. Sure. Paradise is a, 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 a nice little fact, if, 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 sure. which just follows. Paradise is, I believe, a Persian loan word from Pardes, which uh, refers, I think, to a walled garden with springs. Something yeah, that's right. So it's, yeah. It's, then I start, excuse me. No, no. It's interesting. A couple of things are coming to my mind. One is just that in the literatures that I've surveyed, um, the most temperate climates, as understood by 19th century um, geographers, uh, literary writers, and political figures were first heaven, which was called the summer land, and then California. Um, <laughs> just, just something to think about. But, but I also wanted to ask you, um, I wanted to ask you, Tony, if Jeremiadic modes of understanding figure into the work that you're doing, because I mean, you talked about the, the revelations as one kind of template through which one might understand global warming. But um, I talk a lot with my students about, you know, what sort of narratives would actually mobilize people to act? And we talk about the tradition of the Jeremiah and the sense uh, that, you know, God essentially chasteneth those whom he loves. And um, if we are chastened, if scourges are set upon us, uh, the biblical flood being one of the kind of meteorological disasters par excellence in the words of Lucian Boya, um, it, then our response should be to make some sort of sacrifice or recommitment to the covenant, and we will then prevail as the chosen. Um, and yet, it seems to me that the environmental rhetoric that demands this kind of sacrifice and recommitment to the covenant, so to speak, has almost no traction with most people. I mean, my sense is with most people. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that you, I, I, you've encountered. I, you're touching on a very important topic. And it's actually interesting if you look at the history of the environmental movement, how many of the major leaders in environmentalism came out of childhood steeped in uh, uh, evangelical type religion. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in a sense, these were often people who, for whatever reason, gave up the faith of their fathers. Uh, sometimes it was actually a rebellion against their fathers. And took up a new cause that allowed them to basically go forth and, and spread the gospel and, and evangelize in this kind of Jeremiah right. kind of approach. So, yes, there is this strong thematic element within a lot of environmentalism of, you know, repent because, uh, you know, doom is near. And you're right. It works to a certain degree with certain audiences, but it does not work well at all with plenty of other audiences. Uh, one of the things I'm quite interested in these days is I'm, I'm trying to look at the American public and to say, who are these different groups? Who are these different cultural groups? And what are the values and worldviews that, that bring them together? And I, I won't go into that in much depth, but I, I'm very interested in how different kinds of messages, different kinds of framings, different kinds of metaphors resonate with different types of groups. Mm -hmm. So one group, if you give them the message, look, global warming is important because it's going to wipe out a third of the species on this planet, including the polar bear. Mm -hmm. That works for some people. Mm -hmm. Other people uh, need to hear it about in terms of moral and Christian terms. Say, this is an important issue. In fact, we're seeing major movement within the evangelical right here in this country right now with a number of leaders coming out and saying, this is our this is an issue that we need to care about from a moral Christian standpoint. God told us to till and tend the garden. We are stewards of this earth and we are not doing a good job of it. Also, Jesus told us to, to uh, tend to the needs of the weak and the poor and the sick. And we are people who go over to Africa and help with famine relief and so on. How can we in good conscience ignore a problem that's going to push millions more people right. into those exact same circumstances? These are powerful uh, messages for those groups that you would never hear from a scientist. Mm -hmm. okay? And so the, the point is, is that there are these different themes and climate change happens to be so fundamental it, it, it touches all of our lives in such deep, deep and profound ways that it in fact can be framed described in many, many different ways that are in some ways all equally valid. Mm -hmm. It does seem that, that the, not only these, these different kinds of explanations and framings that you're talking about, but they lead to different courses of action. So sometimes they might lead to individual moral responsibility and there are pe you know, people who will be very careful to recycle and not reflect on that, perhaps not at all work for more collective solutions. And then there are other people who do see some kind of change in policy and that was in, with different countries, different nations, there are different views of responses with to this, climate change. Yeah, I mean, one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that these discussions willy-nilly tend to become a bit ethnocentric. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, part of that interesting backstory that you were telling about the evangelicals and the part of the evangelical right in this country that's, you know, pro-anti-climate change action, <laughs> you know. Right. Right. Um, one of the slightly nervous-making phenomena is uh, the um, coming together of the climate change scientists with these people. And uh, you know, some of my colleagues who are among the leading climate change scientists in the world have um, tell very interesting stories about the meetings they've had with these leaders, including, by the way, the dean of your own school. Yeah. Um, the, um, they went in thinking, you know, how could we possibly make common cause with these people who believe, believe in creationism and, you know, that the earth began 6,000 years ago and, you know, how can we possibly have common beliefs? And then they come away astonished and uh, reinvigorated because there's a common sense of stewardship and an ethic of caring that they find cuts across between the scientists and the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. But you go into developing countries and you find a lot of talk about how climate change rhetoric is really a whitewash for not talking about other things like mm -hmm. inequality, like poverty, mm -hmm. like persistent um, uh, in a disorder that still continues old colonial dispensations and so on and so forth. And, you know, some of India's most prominent environmental organizations more or less have decided that climate change in those terms ought to be treated as a rhetorical framing that they don't want to accept because some of the solutions that go with climate change um, end up perpetuating the same kind of economic disparities that, that characterize the world today. So for instance, what 
we, in some sense, hail as policy breakthroughs of tremendous significance, like we've decided to marketize emissions. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of it. It's an ontologically extraordinary move. Who here has seen an emission? You know, and yet we have futures in them. But maybe all futures are things we never could see, but we yeah. bet on them. So, and, you know, so there's that sort of stuff going on. But it's considered you know, we give out Nobel Prizes for thinking of how to marketize new things, right? I mean, you know, it's considered an act of immense creativity to reconfigure things like weather and climate yeah. in terms that allow us to trade it, yeah. you know? Um, and so what happens? Well, the people whose climate is cheaper get bought out by the people who's, who've got the money, I mean, in a sense. So, so you know, tree, who, who gets to plant the trees that are supposed to save us from greenhouse gas buildup. Well, it's the tree planting is happening in the poorer countries, you know, perpetuating a certain kind of, of um, uh, distribution of mm -hmm. agriculture versus industry. And I think, I mean, I haven't done this. I don't know whether you have. The story's too new. But some of the reporting of the unveiling of the nano in India that I'm sure some of you have seen, this sort of new generation, the, the Model T of India is the way it's being talked <laughs> about. But millions will be sold. And of course, they're cheap. But of course, they're carbon intensive things. I mean, you know, so what sort of effect is that going to have? And I think that the northern reporting and the southern reporting on this kind of phenomenon illustrates that there is not a universal discourse of climate change with everybody falling into the same bandwagon, even if the climate change scientists are finding it comfortable to talk to the evangelicals. I mean, that is an American phenomenon, sure. and it doesn't extend around the world. I wonder if we want to follow up on the discussion of how narrative mediates the experience of weather and climate by talking about other media um, and visual as opposed to verbal representations. Um, so painting, I mean, historically and today, paintings, photographs, movies, the internet. Um. I just have to throw out one tiny anecdote. I went a couple of years ago to an exhibition of Cartier-Bresson right after he died in India. Um, and he did a lot of photography in India. And of course, Cartier-Bresson's pictures, I mean, you just wonder, I mean, maybe you don't because you're a talented photographer yourself, but how the eye and the camera lens could have been there in that instant, you know, with the patterns, just so it's, it's mm -hmm. a sort of amazing thing. Um, and the India pictures are fascinating, but in the same room, there was an exhibit of Indian photographers, some of whom had actually been influenced by the Western photographic tradition. But the very first one that I saw suddenly made me realize that in all of Cartier-Bresson's work on India that I've seen, weather is not there. Because this picture by an Indian photographer was of six figures, very artistically displayed, huddling under a cement bus stop with the rain slamming down. And it was called monsoon or something like that. But Cartier-Bresson's pictures are eternal sunshine. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no monsoon. So it's a very interesting little, um, you know, what the Western eye sees when it goes to this other place, as opposed to what the indigenous eye might see. Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to the question of, is there weather when the weather is good? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about the day after tomorrow? Well, um, sure. I mean, part of the theoretical background I come from uh, is the recognition within my field, which is the perception of risk and how people make judgment and decisions. Uh, is that we've of late come to recognize that human beings, and we've come to this of late, uh, human beings have two different ways of processing information about the world. One is what we call the analytic system, and that's this slow, rational, deliberate, logical chains uh, uh, type thinking. It's what we go to school to learn, to be trained, to be disciplined how to do. Um, but at the same time, we also have this enormous other system, which we call the experiential system, which Ben was referring to before. It's the realm of actual embodied experience, of imagery, of feeling, of emotion, of narrative, of myth, uh, et cetera. And this system turns out to actually, <coughs> if not determined, strongly influence the vast majority of decisions we make in our everyday lives. In fact, most of them, of course, unconscious. We're not thinking about most of the decisions we make. Uh, and so I got very interested in this interplay because climate change is one of those issues that by the time we've all physically experienced it, it's too late. 
there's so much momentum in these forces that there's, by the time we've experienced it, we're already committed to even more uh, dramatic impacts. So I got very interested in the idea of vicarious experience. This is a way that human beings, in, through culture, through story, one of the oldest human inventions there has to be, uh, find ways to communicate experience from one person to the next, from one generation to the next. And so that led me to film, because I would argue that film is perhaps the preeminent uh, artistic uh, medium of our culture that engages directly this experiential processing system. Films give us strong images, uh, vivid images, strong emotional content, characters that you're asked to identify with and to, in a sense, live in their footsteps as they go through a narrative. Um, and what I and the other thing is that of course is that when you go into a movie theater, you're asked to check your disbelief at the door. Okay, when we go in, we are all willing to suspend disbelief, to suspend critical judgment, and for the sake of the movie, believe in hobbits or you know <laughs> space battles and far away galaxies, etc. Um, for the sake of the story, and as a result, I I thought that perhaps movies are one of the ways that basically then scientific information information about problems like climate change can in a sense fly in under the radar, engage with this experiential system and change it. So I actually did a national study uh, where I looked at the impact of The Day After Tomorrow, which was a Hollywood disaster film which tried to represent an abrupt climate change, catastrophic. It took a lot of scientific, uh, took a lot of artistic liberties with the science. Um, but nonetheless, we did a survey before the movie came out another national survey uh, several weeks afterwards and found that the film did in fact have a very strong impact on the people who went to see it. Uh, it made them much more convinced that it was a real problem, uh, that it was much more likely to have all sorts of negative implications, they were more supportive of policy, they were more willing to change their own individual behavior. I mean, really a, a, a profound uh, kind of a change. And, I could go on about that, but I won't at this point. Um, I mean, I, want, I wanted to ask, maybe we, Holly could be a because she just finished curating this whole show, and the whole nature of the show is based upon <laughs> imagery of weather and, and, and funny and aesthetic, aesthetic premise. Uh, do you want to, Holly, do you want to come to the microphone and just say a couple of words, maybe, about the... Uh, <laughs> I hate to put you on the spot, but you seem like such a valuable Petri dish Actually, for this. this question just came in from one of the artists on the website. Um, Fernando, who's done the, uh, what he called the Brainstorm series, which I think had to do with his inner, uh, inner storms as well as external, but he said, uh, as a collective, well, should we wait until... Well, go ahead. Say, no, say that, let's, I'll wait for that. But um, as far as the, the uh, it was very difficult to, to curate a show on weather because of, I think, of the kinds of things that have been talked about here today thus far, and all of the varieties of political, social, uh, artistic, uh, personal, collective interests that are, are being part of, of this discussion and conversation. So I think we'll, we'll just wait for, to offer, um, I'd rather offer the question from one of the artists, and we don't have to answer it right now, but as a collective experience, do you think weather and climate have played an important role in differentiating most first and third world country profiles. And I don't know if you want to answer that now, but you can hold that for later, thanks. Um, so I guess we have two questions on the table now um, about uh, visual uh, representations of weather and um, the question from the artist, which I'm not sure if it relates to the visual issue. but. I wonder if I could just say a few words and follow up to Tony. It's actually more of a question for everybody than a comment, but um, I was interested in how how non-experimental formally both the films The Day After Tomorrow and An Inconvenient Truth were. And there may be other uh, films about climate change that are more interesting in a formal and technical sense. But I was troubled in a way by the, the way that um, a kind of absolute closure is brought to us at the end of Day After Tomorrow. And the closure literally is, is the ice covering most of the northern hemisphere. And then from space we see these astronauts saying, look, it's finally clear, you know, because these polluting nations have been covered by ice. 
And then there's this kind of alternate sentimental narrative about all of the nations that have been mistreated, misrepresented, in fact duped in certain ways by the rhetoric of climate change, the global south, so to speak, embraces refugees from the north tearing across the Rio Grande, tearing down the fences that were built up by our robust security regime. You know, and this and this is the kind of closure that we're offered, which seems like a sort of um, I don't know, a, a, a kind of band-aid for the troubled liberal imagination perhaps of Emmerich, the German director, but also for the American viewer who might already buy in to the possibility of climate change and his or her own um, implication or, or implication in that problem. And then with an inconvenient truth, we have a film that's not really a film, it's a lecture, which in a way I, I love because I love the thought of a kind of nerdy lecture like Al Gore, you know, uh, make, becoming this wonderful, masterful film, the film that everybody just thought was the film of the year and so exciting, but it's not a film that really utilizes film technique or film artistry in any way. So for me, those films were, um, were narratives that offered solutions, that offered provocations to the imagination, that offered the fantasy of an end that has yet, not yet come, which I think is important for us to see. Um, but at the same time, they didn't call upon the senses in the way that books that try to represent the global do, where I think the global and global environmentality are called up more along the temporal axis, where people are trying to think about simultaneity and lives lived in different parts of the world by strangers, but nonetheless less lives lived simultaneous, uh, simultaneous, simultaneously, excuse me, as my tongue uh, gives out. But, but there's, there's something about the, the way in which film has so far tackled this problem that seems very, um, it seems to not challenge the senses very much or really challenge the imagination very much. And I, this may just be my complaint, but I wondered if others um, saw that as a potential a problem. Question coming on film. Yeah. Uh, Larry Cutler, former baseball player and a history major. Uh, if you watch the uh, recent playoffs between Colorado and Arizona, they were playing in snow. <laughs> and it changed the whole nature of the game, it changed the whole nature of what the players could do. And that, that, to me, is like an example of what you're talking about. And to me, it seems like this, the difference between weather and climate, it's not really that much. I mean, it's a historical abstract. It's really about weather. You know, and every year, for example, in baseball, the weather changes around World Series time. And it's just not the same thing. The same thing with football, with the Patriots play in tremendous snow and everything. They're not the same team that they are otherwise. Well, if you take history, and you got to look at the individual and the collective, as you said, how the collective changes it, either players and also those watching it. Well, if you take history, for example, I took the history of Russia at one time. You look at 1812, you know, supposedly, and it's probably somewhat true, because of the weather, the Russians won. Although the, the morale of the Russians was better than the French. I mean, the French were going down, and the Russians were coming up. They were fighting for their, for their fatherland, motherland, whatever you call it. Right. Or if you take World War II, it wasn't just the weather that beat the Nazis. Not at all. It was the morale and the way the Soviet Red Army fought that won. So there's, also, there's both aspects to this thing. There is the, the way the humans are motivated, and there is the conditions. But whether... whether Every year is somewhat the same, you know, and it, it might change, but you can predict it to a certain degree. You know, so I really don't, you know, weather is climate. Climate may be weather, but weather, or climate is weather. <laughs> well, if, I, if I can add it, if I can kind of springboard off of that, I mean, I, I think the definition was given earlier that climate is a mathematical uh, abstraction of weather. And, you know, and I agree with that. Uh, from a scientific standpoint. But, but on the other hand, I think we are all intuitive climatologists. Uh, we all, because of memory and experience, I mean, we all remember what the weather was like when we grew up. And we have some way of mushing all those years ago and saying, gosh, I remember when I was a kid it used to snow a lot. 
but it doesn't seem to snow so much anymore. And in fact, my own research is finding this over and over, that many people are in fact drawing on personal experience to, to track change over time. So as an example, uh, I was talking to a, a guy up in Alaska, and he says, oh, I know exactly what you mean. He said, 20 years ago, whenever I would take my kid uh, trick-or-treating around Halloween, we would have to choose costumes that were like the Michelin blimp, or the Michelin <laughs> man, you know? The kids would be totally covered to keep warm as you went from door to door. He says, now you can go out trick-or-treating in your, in your coat sleeves, or your shirt sleeves. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that people do draw upon their own personal experience, and I think we do have a sense of whether, whether, uh, whether the climate has changed. Now, that doesn't mean that our experience is always right, our experience is obviously limited to what we personally have experienced or what our immediate friends and family have experienced and told us about. Um, and that's one of the real powers of global science is that for the first time we are able to piece together global weather and, and, and track it in averages over time. I mean, we wouldn't know about global climate change if it wasn't for that scientific ability. Um, but nonetheless, I think the individual experience still plays a role. And that Halloween example is just a fantastic one because I, you, some, I, I, as an anthropologist, might imagine that it's only in traditional societies, some peasant village where there's the annual festival and you, uh, you do the something and there, there's some event that people would track the climate. But here we've got, we've got Halloween, we've got the World Series, and there are many po there are enough points. Uh, now, there is the, the myth of the White Christmas, which is a, a song more than a, an ever really being reality for much of Americans, so there's the the models of how the weather should be, which I think sometimes are a little bit askew with what the past was, much as memory can be can be false. But it, these are, in a way, both vivid individual experiences. This man who always remember taking his kids with one kind of costume, it's his individual experience, but it's also marked by a collective event mm -hmm. rather than, I mean, you could have perhaps remembered my kid's birthday party on October 29th, but but it's more like the Halloween is just so memorable. And so it's memorable to him, and it's also very, uh, he, it makes a good story. It's easy to convey, to tell, very uh, a narrow, you can narrate it. And, uh, that's, I, th I, so, so, I think now that we're talking about early childhood memories, we should open up the discussion to the audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to pick up on what you said. Can you say, identify yourself? Uh, David Kirkpatrick, I'm a writer of technology. Uh, and what you said was interesting, you know, this issue of perception versus reality, um, when, I mean, global warming is more or less a proven scientific reality, as far as I understand it, but if you look at the reason that the average American believes that, it isn't because of believing the science so much as because they think they have noticed the weather changing, and therefore they have concluded that global warming is happening, even though it is also scientifically demonstrable that the variations that we see day to day could very well be caused by things that have nothing to do with global warming and might be normal variations within a, a smaller set of systems. Um, and, and that, I think, is interesting to think of. And the, but there was an, a related point that I was, I was thinking about as I was listening to you. You know, if you depend, it depends on how broadly you define what climate is. And so much of the discussion has been based on our perceptions when we des describe what we perceive to be climate and weather. But in reality, there are a lot of things that are scientifically measurable that are not measurable by our, our immediate senses, which are changing dramatically. And there's an interesting one that I happen to have written about, which it stuns me how little attention is given to it. And that is the increasing prevalence of electromagnetic fields in the atmosphere. And if you think about what it is that makes everyone in this room cell phone work all the time, it is, it is a reality that there is a massive change in what used to be an essentially electromagnetic, you know, or natural electromagnetic environment that has been permeated by transmitters of vast range of frequencies and of, at vast intensities that are increasing every day. And there's a, there's a term that has been used, uh, electromagn electromagnetic smog, um, by the relatively small number of people who actually even think about this. And it's, but the reason I mention it is that it's a stunningly small number of people who ever even give this any thought. The only way it ever comes up is people worry if their cell phone might be giving them cancer, or they worry if the electro the power station might. But the reasons that those could potentially give us cancer, and they're 
it's not dismissed as a possibility, is because they emanate radiation that does extend throughout our environment at various levels of intensity and frequency. And I mean, if you could see the radiation in this room and you'd been here 10 years ago, it would have been gray and today it would be black. And it's just worth noting, I think. It, it, it just, I, oh. I would just like, actually my comment really compliments the uh, one that was just me, made. Could we just uh, the oh, sure, add to that and then, and then did you want to add to that? Just the, this whole question of how you can feel the weather and experience the weather, it's actually quite terrifying to think about all these changes to the electromagnetic uh, field, so I'll probably worry about it for another 15 minutes and then return to whatever <laughs> was in my mind. But, y you know, we can believe it and I might notice if my cell phone's a little quirky, I might note, remember that and somehow I think we see confirmation for beliefs or something. But the weather, uh, we can, just to go back to, it's that intimate quality, that it's, it's weird mixture of banal and extraordinary. We all can experience weather. We think that w when climate change, as climate change comes, we're going to be here to see it. And there are other kinds of changes. These genetically modified foods, this, you know, your, your, your cornflakes, do they have genetically modified corn or not? You can't tell by looking at them. There's so many of the environmental threats that are invisible and imperceptible, and weather is different in that way. And that's just one of the things that's so distinctive about it. I want to make a comment that ties this back to what Stephanie was saying about the films before. I mean, I, I think the whole question of how we see things collectively or individually is an extraordinarily important political question. Uh, so uh, a colleague of mine at the Kennedy School said after Katrina, it took a terrible hurricane for us to see poverty in America again. Mm -hmm. And I started wondering who's the us and to whom was poverty invisible mm -hmm. that it took Katrina to see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, anybody who ever went to New Orleans before Katrina knew that if you were white, there were places you could go absolutely safely and other places where you shouldn't go. And anybody knew what the map of the city was like and that there were poor places and, and rich places. So why did it take Katrina to make it visible? Mm -hmm. And, you know, from that point of view, your sort of uh, traditional resources of filmmaking. I mean, if you see these as essentially propaganda films, even if we're for them, right. propaganda films don't usually use very subtle techniques. I mean, you know, they, they take the sort of established rhetoric of visual communication and, and play with them and build on and with them. And we're talking about a polarized arena where people are trying to convey particular messages. So I think that the... I mean, I do think that the visual stuff is extraordinarily important and we should be thinking about it. And, you know, I don't think we've begun to scratch the surface, but one question that I think we have to keep in our minds is who has the capacity, the resources, the technical know-how, the ability to reach out to television and other media to get their techniques of visualization made to be the common discourse at all? I mean, you know, Al Gore can do it. Right for a whole set of reasons that actually include the White House and American political power behind it. You know, not, not every one of us that wanted to make a message about climate visible could go out there and make it visible. If I could just follow up on that and then uh, uh, um, the, the question, the person who's surprised by the poverty or we hadn't known about the poverty in a way may lead a life of comfort and oblivion, but the, the a truth. professor typically does. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth behind what that person was saying is that Katrina created a scandal, and that a scandal is it, it, it may be something that people hadn't known before, but it's 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 a truth that's shared publicly, and it's also something that's again linked to what Tony was saying. It's also something that's felt. It's not merely wrong, but it, it has a visceral kind of quality, and you can. Wonder you could either go in a sort of a representation and public culture sort of spin on scandal, and you could also do a more limited attention. We, we, we the world is too filled with scandals and uh, to, to keep track of, but that if that did cause, there was that conjunction of the weather and the, the visibility that did make a make that scandal. I, I'm just noticing that there's an interesting theme emerging here, which is that um, our experience of weather has a lot to do with the communications technologies that we have available, and that's well known in the history of meteorology, that um, the ability to track storms, for instance, depended on the development of the telegraph. Right. Um, telephone lines were even used as um, measurement instruments in um, geophysics in the late 19th century. Um, 
do, do you want to say more about how changing technology is? Okay. Um, no rush. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can come back to almost anything we want to say. <laughs> so. Now, basically, what I wanted to get into was something that's concerned me for many years, and in respect to the global climate issue, it's being addressed by most people from an ivory tower perspective, and by that I mean most of us are unwilling to look beyond our immediate areas of expertise, and we've all addressed that to a certain degree. I, I believe Sheila and, and yourself, Anthony, perhaps have, have a somewhat broader perspective. Uh, for example, I mean, we talked about collective, uh, you know, as a group, and, and find collectively, my own personal feeling is collectively most of us are looking for an easy out rather than having to commit ourselves to doing uh, something. Stephanie talked about Yi Fu Tuan. He has the answer to some degree, because in his early uh, books, at least, he dealt quite frequently with orientation of cities, urban environments. And, and speaking of urban environments, the crux of, of the issue comes down to, well, regional impacts to some degree. Now, uh, urban heat islands are pretty well established and accepted. Uh, and that's clearly man-made. We have lake effect snow and rain, something else that's basically well accepted. You know, El Nino's in the news every year, that may be natural, but, but that's accepted. But yet, when it comes to uh, alternative energy approaches, uh, the, I blame the media mostly because they should be doing their job, and personally, I like to believe that the scientific community is doing the work, but it's just not getting out there, although I can't find that much addressing it. But there isn't an environmental uh, energy source that doesn't have a problem of one sort or another. Now, personal, personally, I think boiling water with nuclear power you know, is a bit of overkill. But the alternative sources have their own problems, but they can be dealt with readily now because they're not widely spread. Uh, solar energy, for instance, photovoltaic cells. To get significant amounts, you have to cover a huge amount of land. There's no way that is not going to affect microclimates in the immediate area. Same thing with wind farms. Anything that's downhill, say you set up a wind farm at the head of a valley, you will affect the microclimates downhill. The amount that we need that will do that, we certainly don't know. And of course, you can start playing with chaos theory as well and, and how that boils into it. I don't believe the existing climate and weather models right now have the ability to even handle that to some degree because a lot of that could be put to some good use as far as I know. Fine, we'll cover the uh, rooftops in urban areas with collectors and get rid of the uh, heat that way, but creating electricity necessitates energy conversion and once you deal with energy conversion there are pluses and there are minuses and that is not being addressed and that's the problem with even things like Al Gore's a uh, movie which I think was great for most people, but he did not address the fact that nothing is all green, and now's the time to address them. And you know, perhaps you can address it because you're involved in the technical part. But even artists, uh, at some level, they're the ones who should say, "Well, wait a minute, is everything perfect?" It's interesting that this. To the other area I work on other than environment is uh, biotechnology and genetics. It's interesting that the art world has seems to have done much more with um, producing critical commentary you know from the from the uh, glow in the dark bunny uh, to various other things i mean it's not hard to find artistic works that um, either make fun of or display horror at or um, mobilize politically opposition against uh, the products of biotechnology. It's very difficult to find a comparable body of work in popular visual culture that deals with climate-related phenomenon, phenomena. There is, the biotechnology in a way is both even more intimate in that it's the cells in our body, are, that we eat the foods, or, or perhaps our DNA will be rearranged. I think that's immensely troubling. But there is also, in a way, its invisibility requires it to be rendered visible. And there are possibly, as um, 
that there's... But it's also, it, I mean, I think that's right, but it's also a place where uh, nature and culture come together and, and so people's um, sense of being offended at blurring those boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, we have the Franken morpheme that we can mm -hmm. attach to yes. anything to convey that sense of the monstrous. Um, there isn't as yet a similar discourse of monstrosity around mm. changing the climate and, you know, making things untenable because of uh, the kinds of things that we're bringing about climatically. Um, maybe it's because of temporality to some extent. Uh, it, it know, might, that it's, it, it, there's it, a gradualism to it. it there is. I mean, it, imagine, I mean, and you can, there, there may be sharp changes. There may be these events that go in with this vividness and this that are also collective that, and, and you know, you can pick whatever they will be. I mean, w will will Venice have to be abandoned, for instance? Will they have to? It will be. It will. It, there's just no question. And so when they have to actually move, it, it, it's actually troubling to even think of moving the Piazza San Marco somewhere, it Disneyland. Does, it, <laughs> it does seem like it's harder to draw a line between the normal and pathological when it comes to climate than when it comes to biology. Well, except right. for the scientific community, it seems perfectly unclear of where the line between normal and pathological is. So for instance, where we have scientists at most major universities these days happily creating things called chimeras, you know, <laughs> implanting uh, human neuronal cells into mouse brains and so on. And, uh, you know, from a lot of points of view, you might think that that was crossing the most ordained divine line in most world religions and so on and so forth, and yet um, there's no felt um, offense at some of this. I mean, you know, the, these are sort of bioethics bodies that I sit on and so on and so forth, and the discussion there is really quite bland. You know, people say, oh, well, it sort of depends, you know, are we talking Stuart Little or are we talking about rats of them? Mm -hmm. uh, or they say, well, I wonder what it would be like to train my lab technicians or my animal technicians if they come in in the morning and see the mouse reading the newspaper, you know. <laughs> but, but it's right. not like, <laughs> I mean, they're not offended at the thought. It, it, and so, anything that will get newspaper circulation okay, up, yeah. I'll tell you, that's another thing you could vary about. I'm, I'm going to let Tony respond and then we'll take the, yeah. these questions. Okay. So, so one thing I'm really struck by is that you just talked about one of the crucial cultural narratives that we use to interpret biotechnology, and that's Frankenstein or Goethe's Faust. I mean, we all, I mean, there are these deep cultural stories in which we are told to be skeptical of the scientist, the mad scientist who comes up with the technology that ends up either destroying that themselves affects or, life. or affects life in some way. So there's an already set storyline. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, in climate change skeptics, I'm amazed at how often uh, the naysayers use things like the story of Chicken Little. In fact, I bet if we took mm -hmm. fables, ch child's children's stories and use them as a template to see, okay, where do we see these being used out there and well, we find them everywhere. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, story is crucial to this. Uh, and I've had a number of conversations with good friends of mine who are filmmakers, and one in particular just argues, he says, climate change is a major problem because our existing narrative structures in the West simply can't handle it. They don't, they just, they don't work in this, in this for this particular problem. And one particular reason is because you don't have a good, a good guy and a bad guy. I mean, the bad guy is all of us, and I'm not a good, I don't want to be a bad guy. I mean, I want to say it's those scientists or it's Monsanto. They're, they're evil and they're potentially destroying the planet. I, I don't like a story where, hey, it's me that's causing this. But Debbie's the historian here, and I think that um, looked at historically, it'll we'll get other sorts of stories about biotechnology as well. Mm -hmm. Just a personal story, because I've been doing research in this area enough to have become living history myself. <laughs> Back in the early 80s, when I was doing some comparative stuff on biotechnology before it became a big issue, mm -hmm. which it became more starting in the 1990s, I walked into a Greenpeace office in the UK, and Greenpeace UK is one of the most active environmental groups there. And I asked them why they weren't you know, why this wasn't on their agenda, biotechnology. 
And they said, well, you know, our mode of operation is campaigns, so-called campaigns. Um, and there's nothing to mobilize around. We can't organize a campaign around biotechnology. Well, 10 years later, Greenpeace was dumping soybeans at the end of Downing Street with a truck emblazoned, Tony, don't swallow Bill's seed. <laughs> <laughs> that they had obviously figured out how to campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I had one just quick follow-up about the problem of narrating climate change. Um, I've read a couple of what I would consider not very successful climate change novels. One is a novel called Carbon Dreams, yeah, Susan Gaines. And I think part of the problem is that it seems to take place at these vastly uh, divergent scales. So you know, you have on the one hand uh, this moment in that novel where uh, the narrative voice is actually seems to be the voice of some sort of a planktonic uh, creature who, which is suffering famine because of the warming of the global seas. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know, you have this uh, intention to invoke uh, a, a kind of global scientific community um, at a massive scale. And I think one of the things that literature does very well is, in fact create and structure scales, but when you're talking about micro scale vis-a-vis uh, -vis macro and there's not a lot of in-between space, which is where I think we usually cathect a narrative, um, that, that is a problem. And I think it is one that will be worked through, but it hasn't quite happened yet. There, there, as there, I see there's it. a science fiction writer who lives in Davis, actually, Kim Stanley Robinson, yes. who's a fairly successful Four Red Mars. of Rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He, his Mars trilogy, I think, was successful in terms of how we might destroy a pristine planet, but I, I haven't read To the... me, you know, his work reminds me a little bit of Jim Fleming's work on the weather changers, and that in some ways, I mean, he talks about terraforming within literature, in other words, forming Earth within literature, and how, as a science fiction writer, he can preview the contingencies that his plots will set in motion. So they're the same kinds of risk scenarios that we deal with in real life aren't necessarily uh, a problem, of course, for an author. And I think that that's, in a way, one of the reasons why narrative, again, doesn't quite work to capture what we're talking about here, because there's so many different feedback loops and so many different kinds of contingent problems that could come out of this. Mm. How, do you, how do you show that visually in a film? <laughs> how do you represent it in literature? Um, there's a solution-focused quality, I think, to Robinson. I think that's, they're really interesting works, but um, but I don't think you get a sense of all the divergent paths that this sort of problem could take and the multiple feedback loops. Do what's what's ironic? The aesthetic mode is more synthetic than the kind of scientific mode, which tends to, you know, you, you, you look at things kind of in different paradigms. I do, although we do, I mean, we can think about postmodern fictions that are not synthetic, and we can think about various kinds of poetry that resist sequentiality. The problem is that those kinds of literatures are not read by many people, or read by only a very, you know, typically elite group of people. So then uh, the political uh, potency of the media, um, you know, falls into to doubt. It's interesting that we haven't talked about Michael Crichton, but we have talked about yes. the day after and tomorrow. You know, and, and Michael Crichton, I heard a, uh, him on NPR talking about how climate change was actually a cover story for the problem of poverty, which completely blew me away because my perception of Crichton, I have not read State of Fear, was that uh, he was that, that there was nothing interesting about what he had to say, but he actually made an argument about how this was a way of not looking at poverty. This whole question of you know if I if I buy a Prius or Prius, excuse me, then I'm a good citizen. I don't have to worry about New Orleans or you know these other kinds of. It's a very scenarios. angry piece of trashy literature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I figure. You know, that's why I've been avoiding it. But <laughs> um, so we've. Well, you've been standing for a while. Hey, I'm uh, Marta Kern, and I'm here visiting from Colorado, and I'm just delighted to be here and um, feel like I've sort of descended into this extraordinary nest of people I want to get to know, all of you. <laughs> I work with an organization called EcoArts, and we bring together major science, environmental, arts, indigenous, horticultural, and educational organizations to look at issues of climate change and sustainability and, and um, through various kinds of um, activities, performances, exhibits, talks, tours, all kinds of stuff. In fact, we have here um, an exhibit called Weather Report, Art and Climate Change that was um, 
uh, created in Boulder uh, by Lucy Lepard, who's a well-known visual arts um, curator, and she selected 51 artists from around the country and the world, and um, I'd love to talk to you about that. Yeah. Um, and Eco Arts is, so we work with, with science organizations like NOAA and NCAR and INSTAR and Ceres and all these acronyms. I had no idea what they meant <laughs> before I started off. Um, and various national as well as local artists and performers. It's built um, based on a study that I read in the Journal of Environment and Behavior that's, that, that kind of goes at your discussion of, um, of the cognitive, not cognitive, but um, Sorry, I don't have my notes right here, but the whole idea of the mind and the body working together. Um, um, and the, the study asked the question, why is it that so many people um, know so much about environmental crises of various kinds and are, are just not really doing much of anything about it? One of the study's observations was that most um, effective action is a combination of cognition and affect, your mind and your heart working together, and that most study of environmental problems is cognitive says we have a we have a problem, let's come up with a solution. There are hundreds of solutions. They mostly sit on shelves. They believe because there wasn't enough affect to put them in the action. So they believed at least at academia, education should be more affective. I notice outside of academia that if and I would say if with due respect to my dear environmental colleagues, that if an environmental group goes charging ahead with great passion, great affect, but not good science, its argument is also often over because anybody who's against it that they're what they're trying to do will poke holes in it. Mm. Eco arts, um, the idea of eco arts is bringing together the cognitive power of um, impeccable science with the affective power of great art. And then that half an hour that the marketing people tell us we have between the moment that somebody's deeply affected and they go back to their normal um, you know, <laughs> deadened lives, <laughs> speaking of myself as well, that you offer them practical, nonpartisan um, action steps um, to do kinds of things. And we've had tremendous respect and, uh, and, and success with, with a lot of this. Um, and I, I just wanted to, and one of the things that we're trying to do desperately is, is to work on the nonpartisan part, because with all due respect to Al Gore, so many people dismiss climate change as a political, um, yeah. you know, whatever. And, and Too Hot Not to Handle is a very good um, climate change film, if you haven't seen it, that's actually told by scientists. That's a much better alternative. Um, I'm really interested in the power of the arts and what, what everybody has been talking about, th that notion of narrative and how do we ignite the population with narrative. And the films that were talked about, neither w one of them uh, really work um, in terms of doing that. And I'm thinking about, so I've been collecting sort of arts power moments in the history of the world when a particular artwork or movement has been able to shift behaviors and beliefs or beliefs and behaviors. I'm thinking about Uncle Tom's Cabin, for example, mm -hmm. that really, I mean, it just ignited the country in terms of uh, discussion of slavery and abolition. And I don't believe, with all due respect, that, that climate change can't be discussed in a narrative way. I think we've had success in doing that in very tiny ways that we're hoping to develop further. But that I think that it's actually this moment right now, this time of trying to shift people from thinking that it's not a black and white issue. It's not a, it's not a thing about blaming. It is about taking responsibility. And that great art, I remember reading an article that Tony Kushner wrote that it's really, that, that's the difference between great art and sort of agitprop is, is that thing where you really are looking at this agony that we're all in at this very moment trying to make this shift. So this is all this blah, blah. But what I really want to know from each one of you, coming from your extraordinary vantage points of the research that you've done and the experience that you've had and the scholarship what would be those artworks that you, what would be the narratives that you would want to see being created through the arts at this time? What, what, what are those things, for example, that you see that America thinks about climate change? You know, it, it, it has to be personal, it has to be visceral, it has to be, but, but what else? And so, so give me a movie. <laughs> or a dance, or a theater piece, or... or um, Whatever. Are you going to give us time to think about it? <laughs> give us your email. Yeah, take another question and let the, the, I'm one, sure this will stick in everyone's mind. There is one person who's trying to get um, climate change into the media, and it happened to be the conference and meet Andy Revkin, who's uh, yeah, yeah. Who, who's he's, a. So he, he's, a, he's a science and environment reporter for the, for the New York Times and has a blog. And he says that it's actually very hard to write about climate change because it mostly seems like it's far away and in the future and not so immediate. And it, it, it's, one, it, it's that whole point of gradualism. And so um, I, I think that's 
perhaps a, if not a solution, at least a statement of the problem, and that is perhaps a, <laughs> might lead towards towards finding some kind of solution, finding ways to make it more immediate, trying to find the pieces. Uh, so, so I mean, the the maple sugar in, in the, the the maple syrup in Vermont is, I guess, one of the things. I mean, you probably had, I don't know if you have other examples that the um, I, I, NPR did do one of their April Fool's stories on exploding maple, maple trees in, in Vermont. But it is the fact that, they can, they, that you can't get the loss of the fall color in New England is getting a little closer. That's, that's um, so I don't what you What you need is a new Charles Corralt who's going to go and, and tell these vanishing stories. I mean, you know, the book, the kind of book is Rachel Carson, right? I mean, that, is, that was a problem that created a particular brand of environmental movement, which arguably yeah. has run its course. But nevertheless, that was a book by a scientist who, uh, of course, is vilified even on the pages of the New York Times by some others of its science writers, even to this day. But nevertheless, what she did was take an invisible problem, a collective problem, a widely dispersed problem, and made it into seeable stories and the kinds of stories that resonate in America are lost stories. So Eden was and now is not. That kind of story is very powerful and Rachel Carson told that in Silent Spring in a brilliant sort of way. And I think Charles Carroll's On the Road series, which among other things got the bottle bills going all over New England for instance, it was also that kind of narrative of the loss of Eden. It used to be that there were these beautiful roads and these beautiful places and now look we've littered them and what a scandal and a shame and we can clean it up so, so I think those are stories but there's a but I just want to say one thing which strikes me as you know cutting in a somewhat different direction I mean I think we've produced climate change as a problem in part by erasing the very immediacy of it in my own work I've shown uh, over and over again how significantly the Apollo missions and America's space adventures affected our ways of thinking about the climate and there's a very direct visual, rhetorical and political connection between the capacity to see the Earth in a systemic way from space as the enclosed biosphere and hence limited and hence fragile and so on and so forth and the rise of climate consciousness. Now I think that that line of connection from visual to aesthetic to political to moral has resonated in America in part because we have a long history of looking at nature in that sort of transcendental way. If you think of the Hudson Valley painters, the paintings are of the sublime and people, if they're represented at all, are teeny, teeny figures, very iconic, usually in the center of the picture and usually <laughs> reduced to nothingness. And if you think about histories of American colonial expansion, it's been at the expense of erasing the fact that there was human habitation there before, so that the first arrival of the Europeans was indeed the moment of encounter with nature and the previous things didn't exist. A very poignant moment to me is when the World Commission on Environment and Development, which which produces the idea of sustainability as a, as a global way of thinking about these issues, goes around the world having hearings before it publishes its report. And there's a little quotation in Our Common Future where they quote a Brazilian person responding to them at one of these regional hearings. And the Brazilian guy says, um, you talk a lot about survival, but remember that some of us still live. And we don't want to be brought down to the level of, we who still live do not want to be brought down to the level of survival. Now, if it's a very sort of rich and paradoxical statement, but if you start thinking about what it's about, it's saying you guys with your superior science, your superior knowledge, have indeed created a problem, but it's so systemic that it's not really linking in with us who still do this thing called living. I mean, you know, survival is too global, it's too abstract, it's too collective, it's too model-bound in a way, and we need the return to the situated, clinical, local, individual, personal gaze in some way. So, I mean, you know, I think that there is this sort of translation problem, you referred to it before, of, 
you know, I don't think it's a problem of finding a middle language. Mm -hmm. I think it's a problem of connecting this ongoing set of things. Tony also referred to it when he said there are two ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think there are two ways of knowing. I think each one structures the other. But in any case, they're not often in conversation. The survival talk and the life talk are not mm -hmm. often in conversation. And I think, you know, for you, the challenge is to figure out how. Mm -hmm. I think Rachel Carson is a good example of a book. The curious thing is... I think we should let this down and go on. Uh, Dr. Earl, did you want to... I'm Henry Earl, and I have an observation and a question. The observation is that it's interesting, uh, and maybe it has to do with meeting in Manhattan, but the one uh, historical experience that we all share about the climate weather is agricultural droughts in the Bible in pre-biblical times, periods of terrible droughts, periods of the flood. So we really have dealt as, as, as a human group, we've really dealt with this, these issues for a very long time. Uh, when I came and joined these, this mob, uh, there were only two billion of us. Now there are, I think, six, and we're headed for eight. And that, of course, makes a huge difference in this. Uh, so that brings about my question, and my question is premised partly from hanging around this building for the last 40 years off and on. <laughs> Uh, should I feel guilty about global warming, uh, or can I see it more, or can I see it more as a disease? Uh, and in a way, I think about it a little bit like HIV, because I felt guilty about HIV uh, about 1978 to 1982, I felt guilty about HIV, and I'll explain to you why. I felt guilty about it because I was seeing people who had a disease which looked like it was a viral infection, and I couldn't figure out what it was about. And in 82, a couple of smart people figured out what it was about. And then I stopped feeling guilty about the situation, and I began to look at what could be done about it, and so far, uh, not a hell of a lot has been done about it, and 30,000, about 30 million of my fellow creatures are infected with this terrible virus right now. So I think one of the things that I'm concerned about, and, and don't be afraid when you answer my question about feeling guilty, is that I'm going to turn the lights off on you. I won't. I will keep my hands in my pockets. <laughs> I think guilt is so connected to responsibility. Right. And responsibility in this case is so collective. And it's, um, I mean, I think it, it, there's kind of, it, the AIDS, AIDS is noticing a problem, considering a possible cause of the problem, and not spreading word about the cause. And that's certainly not a strong parallel with climate change. So I think there's, uh, it, it's a very, even, even, as it's a difficult moment and we're kind of struggling for ways to take action and ways to represent and ways to draw on the imagination to turn to the name, the key element of the name of the center, we're also at an open moment. And so, so rather than, I mean, it seems it, the responsibility often sounds like it's something that can be discharged. You, you see responsibility and then you have the action that meets that responsibility. And I think it's going to take many small acts and many collective acts. And uh, You see, I wonder whether uh, this really is a responsibility uh, or whether it's just a phenomenon which is partly a function of the fact that there are six billion creatures who use fossil fuels, who have invented fire, and who are polluting the environment in this way. And whether uh, we better uh, think about how to adapt to it, how to deal with it, uh, linguistic how anthropologists have determined that New Yorkers don't interrupt, they overlap, because they know how their sentences are going to end and some are going to overlap. And just say that people, there are people who live in countries with equal standards of living as in the United States and half or less of the energy use. There's a lot of room to be made with conservation. We have some bad, we're committed to a bad land use and transportation system, but we can change it. I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting question whether guilt is a sport to action, is it a productive emotion in this context? I don't know, Tony, if you've done any research on this. But. Well, I mean, it, it's, a, it's an issue that's being discussed a lot. And so the little bits of evidence we have is that 
we're all looking at the fact that emotion is one of the primary motivators. Information and knowledge alone doesn't do anything, but you've got to engage in people's emotions in one way or another. And so guilt is one of the emotions people look at, and in fact, there's a fair amount of evidence, and don't tell my mother this, but that guilt actually works. Um, <laughs> Uh, to some degree, because it does invoke this sense that I need to do something, and it is a, it is a motivator. Um, um, you know, another major uh, emotion that people are often pointing to, however, is what's the effect of fear? F because much, as we were talking about before, much of the discourse around this issue is, and around many environmental issues, is doom and gloom. It's catastrophism. You know, we are heading... Well, we're going to bad places, and so, you know, be afraid. And does that work? Um, fear is a dangerous one. It's a very dangerous emotion, and yet it's also a potentially very productive one. And I would say that what the research shows is that fear can be very productive if, as soon as you've evoked the, the sense of fear, you give people an actual action they can go do. Yeah. What people do not like is to be scared, and then I don't know what to do. Then the reaction is, I'm going to deny it, I'm going to you know, displace it, you know, I'm going to sublimate it, I'm going to do something else with it other than act. And so fear can be useful, but it's a very here and now, let me do something kind of emotion. Um, I mean, look at the history of political speech and you can see that fear can work. Right. Um, in a given situation. I wonder if I could just briefly tie this back to the last questioner's question because it seems to me like part of the problem of both fear and guilt being a bit amorphous in the case of climate change so that the question can be asked whereas in the case of HIV we kind of know that we should feel guilty or particularly in that uh, historical moment that was that guilt was a kind of knowledge um, once it was discovered what the disease was but here there's more of an amorphous quality to what is actually being um, experienced and I think one of the reasons that books like Uncle Tom's Cabin were so successful is because they enact a drama of witnessing um, and that <coughs> drama of witnessing involves um, witnessing specific kinds of, of torture and in fact uh, identifying empathically with the victims of that torture and to me one of the most successful narrative objects that's been created has been Spike Lee's um, series When the Levees Broke about Katrina which in some ways you know one could say it's not even about climate change but it is about climate change in the sense that it's about the specific effects of that event that signal hurricane um, on a group of individuals and we're forced to listen to their testimonies and so it's a specific, uh, a specificity that not only is a spur to action, but also um, narrows our affect in such a way that we know why we feel guilty. Um, so I guess that drama of witnessing is something that I think should be part of, uh, of any kind of narrative form that addresses the problem. And to add to that, I mean, that goes back to your question about other stories that we ought to be telling. I mean, another fundamental human emotion is empathy. Okay. And that, I think, is absolutely central to this story. I mean, my own work shows that most people think of global warming as this distant, abstract, c complex thing. And they think it's going to happen to other people in places far away, not Americans, mm -hmm. small islands in the South Pacific or something like that, and in the distant future, 50 years, 100 years, if ever, not now. Okay. And yet there are people whose story can be told right now. Yeah. I mean, this is why I went to Alaska to study. I mean, the Arctic has warmed twice as much as the rest of the world. Parts of Alaska have actually warmed four times as much as the rest of the world. They're seeing severe, significant impacts right here, right now, and these are Americans. So what's their story? What are they experiencing? How is it changing the way that they live? And, and it's, that's just one corner of the world. We could go in lots of other places in the world where climate change is, in fact, already taking hold. And it's those stories that I think are incredibly powerful. I mean, it, 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 to, to see how people very sense of themselves and how they react emotionally, uh, I think, can have tremendous impact on how pe and I'm putting the flesh on the bones of this story. Mm -hmm. uh, young lady here. Hello. My name is Maxine Gann. Um, I have uh, first a question for you, Tony, when it, and that is, what are the other first associations that non-U.S. citizens have? And then I just want to make throw out a comment. Um, clearly, uh, your observation and other people's observations that it's important to um, 
look at the various, the variety of ways that people can be um, touched uh, and the, what needs to go into really motivating people to make changes without overwhelming them with fear so forth and so on reminds me of research that was taken, I think, took place at um, UCSF Medical Center in the when I was there, 60s and 70s, um, and when they were looking at what kind of information to give patients bef um, pre-surgically. And it turns out there are um, maybe two or three different ways of um, answering that question, and of course it depends on the individual. Uh, so some people are affected by fear, some people are affected by uh, no information, <laughs> they have better recovery rates, fewer requests for medica medication post-surgically, um, other people want to have strategies. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, in terms of a potential narrative. Um, what occurred to me as I was listening early on is um, in the realm of food, which mm -hmm. means something to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, there are these rituals that are centered around the weather in terms of what we eat when, which you touched on. But then I thought about the fact that um, there's this current trend, I think internationally, towards local seasonal um, mm -hmm. climate-related eating. <laughs> and that seems to me something that touches on not the negative, but the positive. Mm -hmm. That might be an interesting route um, for you know even people in in Denver or in in Boston. So, uh, so was your question about other associations within the United States? No, uh, out, other, well, outside was what I asked. Oh, okay, in other countries. Well, we don't know in large part, but I have done a study, for instance, in England, and and instead of melting ice, the primary set of associations there is to flooding and sea level rise. Um, so, and, and rain, anything wet, um, uh, which goes back to the point Sheila was making earlier. Um, you know, and, and so I, I can't say much more than that just because the studies haven't been done yet. And in the U.S.? In the U.S., the second most uh, common set of associations are to just generalize warming trends. So when you think of global warming, temperature's going up. Not particularly good or bad. Uh, then come uh, associations to the impacts on non-human nature, not people. So other species, other ecosystems, and their potential threats. Um, and then associations to the ozone hole. And this is a longstanding uh, uh, finding in the United States and around the world that many people think these are, in fact, the same problem. And they're not. They're very different problems. And this actually, I'll go into this for a moment, because it touches on the role of metaphor. Uh, people first learned about the ozone hole, which is a wonderful term. <laughs> The ozone hole, okay, it is a metaphor. And we all have the embodied experience that when there's a hole in a protective layer, like in your roof, you know what you're supposed to go do. You've got to go fix it, right? So the, the term itself carried with it the thing to do, okay? Then coupled, of course, with these wonderful images of the hole itself as seen from space. Um, I think the, the, that one-two punch really had an enormous influence. Uh, then people learned about this thing called the greenhouse effect. And people stick these two metaphors together. And they think, many people think that thus the protective layer is the greenhouse. And <laughs> how global warming is caused is that there's a hole in the greenhouse. That's either letting more sunlight in and warming up the planet, or alternatively, the heat's going to escape out the hole and we're going to go into an ice age. Okay? <laughs> now, you can see the logic in that. It's perfectly rational. It's just wrong because the premises, right. the underlying metaphors are wrong. So, I mean, that's always been a problem for climate change. Climate change, what is that? I mean, what image is there? I mean, that's nothing. It's purely abstract. And global warming is not much better because it's, the fundamental metaphor was a warming, which is, you know, who doesn't like to be warm? So the, the power of metaphor can be really important in the way these things are, are termed in the first place. But we shouldn't make the mistake of running too hard after metaphor uh, because ultimately we fixed the ozone hole not because it was like a roof and we could send, well, maybe it was like a roof and we could send the carpenter, but because we knew who the roofer was. There was a very small number of companies making a very small number of chemicals which had been in circulation for less than 30 years. They were quite widespread because people thought they were safe. But the very same companies 
that had introduced those chemicals into the world in the first place, had started doing research to find substitutes, and they were, DuPont was a leading such company. Mm -hmm. And so the substitute did not cause economic grave hardship to the companies that had been producing the stuff in the first place, and it didn't bring about enormous changes in our way of life. We were able to find other ways of doing hairspray. You know, we didn't <laughs> need concentrated CFCs, it turned out. Well, climate change, I mean, I actually think, from my theoretical point of view, that it's hard to find the metaphor because it's hard to find the solution, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to, do, to do something meaningful about climate change would require action in a much more dispersed way would require, I mean, why are we talking about responsibility and what people understand and don't understand? Most people had nothing whatsoever to do with banning the CFCs. I mean, Reagan developed a nasal cancer, as it happens, at the right time to be persuaded that ultraviolet radiation was responsible for a rise in skin cancer, and he instructed his delegate to the international negotiations differently from the way that delegate had been instructed before. So that was kind of an accidental little political you know, thing that happened. But nevertheless, it was a tiny handful of largely Western world companies that needed to find a substitute. That is not the case for climate change. Mm -hmm. And I think we will find the metaphors if we agree on the problem, not the other way around. It, 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 it certainly is a cycle, but I think there are many there there are many loops. And if small groups get, I, I, I agree with you that we certainly need the big solution. But it could well be that some sm some local acts yeah. of mobilization would help. Dispersed solutions. Yes. Not, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a single mega solution. Yeah. No. I, I think we're going to take one sure. more question. Yeah, we have it right. Here. Oh, we have two more. So we'll look at two young mm -hmm. men. Is talking about the weather for the purposes of making small talk unique to English-speaking cultures? The, the reason I ask that is because in France, they make a great point that they do not talk about the weather for social purposes. And this is something that, that is, is, happens only chez les Anglo-Saxons. And, and you know, north of France is so close to Great Britain. The weather is very similar. They're both and talk about social bonding, but they were both very homogeneous cultures. So I was just wondering, do the Inuit talk about <laughs> the weather for uh, yeah. social purposes? Well, or Oscar Wilde quotation or? that's in our literature, you know, Oscar Wilde, who after all was an exile from England to France and had a more French ironic sensibility about <laughs> certain kinds of things. I mean, what does he say? That talking about the weather means you're trying to avoid talking about something else. I mean, so, no, I don't think all cultures talk about the weather at all. For one thing, I don't think weather, weather as such is a phenomenon in all geographical locations and places. And the particular British art of talking about the weather because it is the banal thing. I was smiling when somebody said, you don't talk to taxi drivers about politics. I talk to taxi drivers in Washington about politics all the time. That is what they want to talk about, at least as much as about the weather. But in British taxi drivers, you talk to them about something else. <laughs> I, I, I will say that people in Uganda do talk about the weather a lot. And it's, uh, they, they don't just say hello. It's a long series of greetings. And the weather, weather comes up at a specific point, And they were. There was someone who, this, this Ugandan meteorologist was visiting California, was on a conference, and somehow was a little jet lagged and was about to start asking me about my cattle. But unfortunately, realized he didn't have any but my, ask, but he did go through the whole family. And I did recall that my daughter had a pet rabbit, so he did get to ask about the pet rabbit just in the right order. And the, so first the family, mm -hmm. then the animals, then the weather. And it's what they do, and it's actually useful information to them, but it's also kind of good to keep track of the weather there it has both a very strong uh, economic importance and a kind of moral importance. The ancestors and gods send rain at the right time. So if weather's coming, light, if the rain's coming at the right time, life's good. And if it isn't, it's a source of moral as well as economic worry. And so they, it's because it's meaning laden rather than divorce from meaning as it is in Oh, well, well I, I think uh, we, we could have a long debate. We, we will continue. Well, you, you get to leave. We're, we're going to go on. And on. I actually think the banality is itself a comment about social life. And, but. Well, sure. can, I, can I just make a comment about that, too? Is that um, 
In fact, it'd be interesting to know what the cultural history of the, talking about the weather is. I mean, to what extent is it a holdover of when America was predominantly a rural society? Because that comes back to, I mean, among the Inupiaq Eskimo that I work with, I mean, weather is vital to life. I mean, it's going to de decide whether you live or die on a given day because you have to know what the weather conditions are like. And in fact, that's partly why they're so concerned about climate change because the, their old patterns of prediction are no longer as valid as they used to be. They're less able to predict their environment than, than before. And so what I'm really struck by is in our modern urban world is the extinction of experience. Okay? I mean, look at us right now. Look at that little box in the wall. We are living, sitting in a climate controlled room. The windows are all closed. We have no connection whatsoever to the outside world. We'll leave from here. Most of us will jump into cars or vehicles or whatever, many of which will be air conditioned. I mean, you know what the American lifestyle is like. We go from our, air our climate controlled house to our climate controlled car to our climate controlled office and back. And we'll spend a little time, you know, maybe taking a hike or going to a soccer game or maybe going to a sporting event that's outside or like taking a walk in the park. But, you know, it's the extinction of the physicality of, of the weather that I think is really, it's part of this broader increasing alienation and separation of the, of the human being from the natural world that I think fundamentally underlies so much of all of these environmental problems, not just climate change. I don't believe in the extinction of the weather. I mean, I know what you're saying about this the sort experience. of the extinction of experience as well. I mean, I think that experience is harder and harder to lay claim to, but I think that the weather constantly erupts into our climate control regimes and constantly reminds us, in fact, of how powerless we really are. And that's why it's such great news. You know, weather is such great news. I mean, there's the Weather Channel, there's storm chasers on PBS, there's, in California, if it rains, the entire community is up in arms because the roads are slick, you know. Anti-pluvialism. Um, yes, anti-pluvialism. And so I think there's this really interesting way in which the weather kind of trumps and challenges a certain postmodern idea of, you know, absolute containment by culture and cultural scripts and, and the, the mechanisms and technologies of culture. And so this question of alienation in some ways I think is, I don't know, I mean I, I don't see that anymore as the question for me, even though I, I do of course get what you're saying. I'm going to go and get into a taxi after this, you know, <laughs> as you are probably. One, one more question I think. Just to follow, we've, we were struck, I, it's, it's perhaps an interesting note that we're struggling for the great weather, for the great climate film. You know your point about the weather and news is is fantastic, and the, and how it's the the history of weather news and the weather channel, and uh, it's uh, so so perhaps it's come to find its medium and its outlet, and the weather channel actually is has take has with you know for a large corporation some degree of courage gone further out on climate change than many other such corporations might have, and. And it kind of frantically pursues the weather, as if the weather could be incorporated yeah. into this indoor world that yeah. we inhabit, you know. Control. Yeah. We haven't talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's of interest to you. It's like, well, this <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, climate um, is just one of the changes that human beings have to learn to deal with. And I'm wondering if anyone has perspective on how well humans can deal with change in general. Um, are we as good as cockroaches? Because one thing we know for sure <laughs> is that the weather's going to change. Whether it's human-induced or not, the climate of the Earth has changed radically over the years, and it's going to continue to do so. Does that mean if we can't adapt to it that we're going to go the way of the dinosaurs? It, or, or should we more concentrate on dealing with the change and learning how to deal with change? It's changed over the centuries, right. and it's now changing over the decades. And humans, I think, do fine with the, humans with much less complex technology have done pretty well, uh, not universally, but generally have done pretty well with these century, that, that, sort of, that kind of time scale, and the decade time scale or, is a much harder one. So well, there have been radical changes. The dinosaurs uh, didn't take too long. Well, it's, uh, th that's looking back over a long time, actually. I think you, you, it's hard to pick out those years and decades in the fossil record. It might have been 
you know, it, 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 you know it's, it's not a, changing that quickly now, actually, either. No, it's, but I mean, the dinosaurs might have taken tens or hundreds of thousands of years, but that was 65 million years ago, so we're the same G, you know. 65 million years ago, they, they were there, and 60 million years ago, they weren't. Well, so do you think we're as good as the cockroaches in adapting to change? Well, we, deal, we have a wider range of options. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>